feels like it's floating. <laughs> That's because your troubles are all gone. Try another puff. In the 19th century, marijuana was far from the recreational drug of a future time. By and large, its only use comes from patent medicines. Americans know little of smoking it as an intoxicant, a custom widespread in the East. That is, until Abdul Hamid II, Sultan of Turkey, makes a very special birthday gift to the American people. 1876, a world's exposition is held in Philadelphia to celebrate the 100th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence. On display are the wonders of the modern world, among them the telephone and the personal printing press, otherwise known as the typewriter. The industrial age has arrived. At the Turkish pavilion, the Sultan Abdul Hamid II makes a gift of a rare and exotic treat. The crown is introduced to smoking marijuana in what may have been the first pot party in the United States, and perhaps the biggest, until Woodstock 93 years later. The Sultan's gift ignites a wave of Yankee ingenuity. Seeing dollar signs in another idle pleasure, entrepreneurs open Turkish smoking parlors in the north. Sometimes people would go to these places in great secrecy, sort of as a lark, and they'd be society matrons as well as prominent businessmen. And they would either smoke hashish or eat hashish-laced confections. At a time when the temperance movement is trying to ban alcohol and close saloons, smoking parlors could have been the alternative way to get high. But the parlors close, Liquor, not cannabis, continues to be the country's drug of choice until a constitutional amendment bans booze and America rediscovers marijuana. New Orleans, 1920. America's second largest port is America's number one party city. In this brawling place, where blacks, French, Cajun, Spanish, American, Europeans, and Chinese live, work, and play, a new music emerges out of the constant clash and commotion of culture. The music is jazz. Marijuana and jazz go together like a melody and lyrics. Where jazz goes, reefers follow. But there's another reason for its widespread use. In 1920, it is the only legal drug in town. Even here, where everything the flesh desires can be had, prohibition keeps the flow of liquor out of sight. The choice of a new intoxicant becomes the perfectly legal weed, shipped in from the Caribbean, Mexico, and South America, and sold like cigarettes in jazz clubs, markets, and pharmacies. It is cheap and popular. But even in paradise, there's trouble. New Orleans is in the midst of a crime wave. Murder dominates the headlines and attracts William Randolph Hearst's attention, eager for a sensational story to sell. New Orleans was a sort of a source, the beginning of uh, concern about marijuana. They saw it as linked to crime, violent crime, or even um, predatory crime. Uh, also, sometimes it seemed to be related to murders, uh, to rape, and so on. Hearst coins the phrase marijuana menace and prints lurid tales about the drug's capacity to cause rape, murder, and mayhem. Just as reports of cocaine-crazed Negroes a decade ago had stirred lawmakers to ban cocaine, headlines and stories of the marijuana menace were affecting cannabis the same way. Society worries about its members who are not in control of their mind. So in order to prevent chaos in society, limit the use of the product or the thing that's inducing those kinds of effects. State lawmakers were quick to ban a drug that they identified with black violence. In 1924, Louisiana joins 14 other states banning the distribution of marijuana for non-medical purposes. And it gets back to the scapegoat. So you can scapegoat different racial groups, you can sca scapegoat the uh, lower classes, um, you can use the drug to do the scapegoating for you. You can attack them because they're using the drug. Slowly and surely, it will be banned across the country, state by state, for one reason or another. In the Southwest, the reason for a ban on pot was economics and prejudice. They were worried about all these Mexicans down on the Texas border who were, uh, it was the depths of the Depression. And 
these Mexicans had been uh, a very useful labor force uh, in the 20s when we needed them, but now as the Depression, you got all these gringos in the bread line, you sure as hell don't need all these Mexicans. So how could we stigmatize them and get rid of this cheap labor force and get them out of here? According to the San Antonio Gazette, quote, the men who smoke this herb become excited to such an extent that they go through periods of near frenzy and worse. It is always aggressive as the crimes which have been committed in garrisons, armories, barracks, and the humble suburbs of Mexico. In 1931, Mexican repatriation becomes law. Mexicans who don't go quietly are subject to varying forms and degrees of harassment. Many are charged with vagrancy. Others are arrested for violation of new state marijuana laws, laws that are often an excuse to drive Mexicans out of the country. So in Texas, for example, if you got caught with one joint, you could get sent to, you could get sent to jail for life. In fact, there were um, uh, campaigns in some of the states for the death penalty. And there are cases of um, people serving many, many, many years, decades in, um, in jails for possession. Except for a handful of states in the Southwest, marijuana is still legal in the United States. But that will change soon after Harry J. Anslinger, the nation's top drug enforcement agent, takes office at the Federal Bureau of Narcotics. But first, Anslinger must convince Congress to do something it has never done before, outlaw a weed. His chief tactic is to convince Congress and the public that a weed is the cause of sex and murder, a message that scares an already fearful Depression-era America. I had to kill him before they killed me. I had to kill him. Can't you understand? I had to kill him. They killed me. I had to kill him. Can't you understand? The History Channel now returns to hook illegal drugs and how they got that way. <laughs> In 1930, the gaiety of marijuana collides with a nation in despair. Across the United States, the Great Depression has brought joblessness, red lines, and above all, fear to America. Let me assert my firm belief that the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. But the nation's fear is not just economic. There are fears of crime and gangsters, unions and communists, immigrants and even alcohol. Since 1920, alcohol has been banned by a constitutional amendment. But after 14 years, the law is repealed. The government now focuses on narcotics under a new federal bureau. The Federal Bureau of Narcotics was, was unprecedented in that it was the sole uh, autonomous uh, bureau charged with enforcing uh, narcotics legislation. 